if the U.S. does go through with banning Chinese telecom mm -hmm. equipment in the U.S., how big of a deal is that? I think it's a pretty big deal, and I think it goes back to, I always start with the high-level uh, important issue. The U.S. and China have to work out a fair trade agreement. Being very candid, I've been in China for 40 years, dating myself. It was always a win-win mentality, but very tough negotiations. The last 10 years, it's been more of a win-lose with the U.S. losing. So you have to create a level playing field. Then as a company or as a country, your, your currency is nothing more than your track record, your trust, and your relationships. So I think we have to get those back on kilt. I think a better example would be how Prime Minister Modi and how India and the U.S. are developing the most strategic relationship. I was there at Vibrant in Gujarat with the Prime Minister just a couple weeks ago, and he tends to think about it how we both win together. It doesn't mean there won't be bumps along the way. And being a long-term fan of China, however, I think we'll work out the differences with but China. But do you think this, this notion that the administration wants to move the needle on security as part of all of this, national security through technology? is going to work, or does it set us up as a bigger adversary? Well, I, I think it will work. It has to work. And secondly, it shouldn't be an adversary. You've got to see how both sides win. And the key is to say that the way things are currently going is not acceptable. You have to have a secure infrastructure. The wars of the future, uh, or the terrorist attacks, will be after the digital infrastructure, the architecture. They have to be rock solid. And if you watch my prior company did very well for 20 years, we maintained the trust of a China, a Russia, and others because we never shared any of the information. So I think it goes back to, as companies and uh, countries, you have to have that open win-win mentality. We'll get it back with China, so I'm an optimist that'll work through. There'll probably be some bumps along the way, but I'd look more at role models like what India's done. I'm curious, you talk about 40 years and then something changed in the last 10. Yes. What was it that changed? Was it a matter of them not needing us as much as they did before? No, I think it was actually a change in philosophy. Uh, I met with Jiang Zemin for an average of two hours, prior president of China, every time I was there. Uh, the fact that he was Dr. Wang's uh, classmate help. I was out of Wang Laboratories when I built the relationship, did the first joint ventures, followed all their leaders on measles charts, identified them 10 years ahead of time before they'd get into the polar bureau, etc. And the Chinese always kept their word to me, and it was always a win-win attitude tough negotiators, but win-win. And the last decade, it's been a win-lose. And that, unfortunately, I think has to be fixed. And that's where I do think uh, the focus on getting it back to a true level playing field. You can't have a trade deficit of $470 billion with us getting 130 and China getting 570 And just 10 years ago, the delta between the two was 100. So that's the symptom of the bigger issue. You've got to get it back on really? win-win. Really? Do you agree pressure. with the president that that's the issue? I mean, isn't it just indicative that we buy a lot more stuff that they make cheaply? Well, what I do agree with is the people in the U.S. and the business leaders are the ones that I listen to the most here, that there's an unequal playing field. The rules that China plays here are different than the rules that American business plays there. You have to do joint ventures, et cetera. This will work out. Shame on us for not negotiating better over the last 20 years. But I think you'll find that we'll work it through and really make a difference on it. But what we haven't really focused on, and we tend to focus about existing companies, is what I talk about each time we're here, the importance of startups for our economy, generating the jobs, and how the U.S. is actually slowing in terms of the startups, the innovation, versus countries like France, which you would have never thought would I be good. I still don't believe it. Every time you come on and tell me France is out innovating us, yes. I find that hard to imagine. What statistics do you actually use, John, to, and, to make that point? And David, you're setting me up perfect, because as you <laughs> all know, the way you deal with a tough question is if it's emotional, you deal with facts. If it's facts, you deal with emotion. So I'm going to ask in the emotional question with facts. The French high-tech community, in terms of investments in startups, did 140 average for a decade. They've gone from 140 to 570 in four years. At the time, the U.S. investments in startups hit a 20-year low three years ago. It is much, much slower. And I took 20 venture capitalists and a number of private equity companies uh, to France during the middle of December, during the middle of the Yellow Vest issues, and we were the only public group that President Macron met with. And he outlined his view about France of the future, a startup community, a win-win between the U.S. and Europe. And then I polled him in front of the president. I said, how many of you believe in the future of France and believe that his direction is right and are going to invest more? Whole room raised their hand. But what is it that they're doing then, John? That I mean, we still have, I would argue, and yeah. I think we all would, the best capital markets that are available in the world, the most transparency, the deepest 
pools of capital. So what are the French doing conceivably? That's and and why isn't water. it helping his approval numbers? <laughs> well, in, in the, or the economy. Well, first, it is helping the economy, so I'll go in reverse order. Uh, the issue is we do not have a national policy either on digitization, which, by the way, India, Prime Minister Modi, his primary goal is digitization, GDP growth, manufacture, startups, equality, health care environment, and so does France, just with a different sequence. So it has to be owned at the very top. Uh, the second thing is you have to decide if we truly are going to be a startup nation, and I think that's where the jobs will come from. The big companies that we discussed before, 40% of them won't exist in a decade. And secondly, all job creation will come out of startups. Big companies and digitization, artificial intelligence will destroy 20 to 40% of the jobs that exist today. So we need a policy. Then you watch how quickly things occur. You can mention something to Prime Minister Modi on a Tuesday, and by Thursday it's done. An angel tax investment is an example that was an Achilles heel for him. He demonetized his currency in a weekend. Uh, huge risk, but it made it so much easier to do business. So they start with what do they want to accomplish as a country, and then what are the things you have to do in unison to make it happen. Modi does his own vision and strategy. Macron does the same. And I think they're two examples we can learn from, and they can learn from us. John, in this country, I think you would hear people say what the federal government should actually do is use the antitrust laws because, and we've had this a little bit, this argument. Yes, we have. Before, that Facebook, I wouldn't say Amazon, argument, healthy give and no, take. Yeah, give and take. Right? Yeah. Alphabet. Uh, and some of the other dominant yeah. providers with huge market power are actually stifling innovation. And antitrust law should be used to unlock that, and that would bring the innovation you're talking about. I know you don't necessarily agree with that. Well, I'm somewhere between the two, David, and I'll remind everyone I am completely on my own and have been for over a year. And the fun part is now I can say whatever I want. And uh, it's kind of like being a grandfather. I get to advise my uh, startups and have fun with them and give them advice and say, here's a tough situation. Now, here's what I suggest you do. Then I go have a bourbon and ginger. Uh, <laughs> if that's really true, there's a, there's a tough situation we wanted to ask you about today. And I can, but I want to finish David's right, question right, if right. I can. Again, the question? About, about monopolies and whether so, or not antitrust law should be used and conceivably would then result in more money going to startups that otherwise are not funded because they compete with these giants. So that's the symptom of what is occurring. The underlying issue is that technology companies have to get back for tech for good. As you saw, we were very strong at Cisco, and so were my peers during the 90s and the first decade of the 2000s. But we always said, how does government and business win together? How do we as a group work to common goals when government raise legitimate issues on either competition or data disclosure or not sharing your information of your operating systems with other countries? We work through it together. I think these companies have to come together and realize that if they don't work with government closer, government will it will have bad consequences regulation anti-monopolistic changes and it's coming so i would encourage the peers of the current leadership group both to work together but also realize if they don't meet the government halfway on legitimate needs of the citizens the government will act and most government leaders know they won't act properly but if you don't respond they will make it happen to your question uh, Scott. We, you know Bezos, we started the hour with bezos yeah. and ami what, what do you think about that? Well, uh, one of the things, first, I think uh, Jeff Bezos is one of the greatest leaders we've had in business in the last two to three decades. I thought I did well at Cisco. He did better. And uh, he's a tremendously good person and in good balance. I'm not going to comment on the personal issue, but I am going to comment on what I advise my startups and others, which is when you have an issue in every company, every leader has setbacks. If you're in power very long, you're going to get knocked down. So the first thing you do is don't hide. The second thing you do is get all the story out, be you know, candid about what is fair criticism, what is not. Then you paint a picture of how you go forward. Jeff will navigate through this. And we love to build leaders up in America, and we love to tear them down. This is also the fun part of advising 18 startups that have investments in and coaching them. And then I say, I know it's going to be hard on you, but exactly like uh, uh, you talk about the leaders of the prior era taught me, Jack Welch, you're more product of how you handle your setbacks than you are your strengths, although nobody likes to write about it. That is absolutely true. You know, I was looking around here at all this technology. Next time I'm on, I'm on here, if you'll get it approved by the exchange, I want to show you one of the startups. D-Drone, it does defensive drone recognition, and it's what shut down Newark, it's what shut down Gatwell, et cetera. They're on fire in terms of the opportunity uh, to protect it, but they also are tying in very closely to electronic mm -hmm. pulse guns. And so what I thought, David, you could fly the drone. Mm -hmm. Carl, I can teach you how to spot it. Sarah, you're shoot going to take it. this gun and shoot it down, but you've got to be careful. If you hit the wrong electronics, you bring down the exchange. <laughs>